Um, here's what I'm going to claim. By the way, this is a, a traditional way of doing academics, which is first you make fun of everybody else, see? <laughs> and then when they're completely destroyed, you go, ah, the knight in shining armor comes along with the truth. I usually hate that way of doing business. But in this case, I find that it works. <laughs> and you can't beat things that work. Um, a more plausible view. Human morality is a product of evolution. In fact, it's, part of, it's, it's a product of an evolutionary dynamic involving the interactions of genes and culture. In other words, culture creates ge our genes just as much as our genes create culture. And our culture is in our genes just as much as our genes are in our culture. And we are not born selfish. And you cannot just teach people any kind of morality at all. It's all equal. Humans are predisposed to accept certain types of moral beliefs and moral behavior and not to accept others. And if you try to change them, you can to some extent, but not, not as much as, as some people would like. I, in fact, applaud the fact that we can't make people whatever we want them to be, yet. Maybe somebody is right now inventing a little cyborg thing you put in the brain of an infant and then it'll do whatever you want. But uh, we don't have that yet. Um, in this dynamic, humans transform culture and the new culture makes new behaviors fitness enhancing. That's why our culture affects our genes because human culture accumulates and it lasts over very long periods of time. Other animals have culture, but they tends to be very episodic. It, it appears and then people forget and then animals forget it and it happens again later and it doesn't accumulate. But we have cumulative culture. That becomes an environment. And that environment then, of course, is the basis for selection of the next generation. So we get biological selection on how people behave in a society where they already have laws and, or rules. I don't want to say laws, that's just not true. They already have rules of, of pro and antisocial behavior. So genes are the product of culture, just as culture is the product of genes. Morality, therefore, is predicated upon a set of evolved human predispositions. The reason I say predisposition is unless you're, unless you're nurtured in society properly, a lot of these predispositions will not flourish, they will not emerge, they will not flower. If you have a very poor family upbringing, dysfunctional family upbringing, you may not get all of these, the, your moral possibilities emerging. Because the, you, basically the, it requires an interaction between your potentiality, your predispositions, and how they're nurtured in society. Just as, just as for instance, if a child grows up not learning, never talking, there, you've seen horrible cases in the news recently about children at the age of 10 who have never talked in their lives because they're chained to a chair for 10 years and never saw another human being except when they're fed. Can they learn how to talk? They cannot. So that predisposition, which is so strong, even such a strong predisposition as speech, can be um, thwarted if without the proper... Um, uh, environmental conditions. But if you have them, you don't have to do much to get kids to talk. You don't have to deprive them of dinner. You know, you don't have to sit them down for hours every day to teach them how to talk. As soon as the time comes, they talk. And they won't shut up. <laughs> right? So that's what a predisposition is. <laughs> the blank slate view is wrong. Even infants have morality. I won't go through this, but go ask the psychologist that deals with developmental psychology of children. Children come into this world with, a pre with some knowledge of what right and wrong is, of pro, pro and antisocial behavior, and uh, uh, they prefer pro-social behavior when they're infants. So we get a, it looks something, here's a diagram. You start out with certain genes and certain culture. Now I'm not going to talk about the environment part here because I don't have time. And from the interaction of genes and culture, you get genetic change, but you also get cultural change. Then with the new genes, again, they affect the next generation or the next period of culture, 
and genes, and conversely, culture affects genes. And this goes on and on and on for hundreds of thousands of years. That's what we mean by gene culture coevolution. It depends on the cultural change being somehow cumulative. That is, people, people develop certain ways of, of um, hunting, and 50,000 years later, they still hunt basically the same way. They may make better spears. They may put feathers on their spears. They may be better at chipping stone. But they're still engaged in the same behavior. By the way, what do you get out of hunting? You know, humans are unbelievable animals as hunters. A chimpanzee, if you give a chimpanzee a rock to throw, it can't throw a rock. Well, it wouldn't hit you. If you've watched the baseball games recently, you'll realize that humans are extremely good at throwing very accurately. And they did that because that's how they hunted. And humans, we have a band of muscles around here that are just for going like that, that other animals don't have there. They evolve because good hunters have more children. Because they can get better wives who are healthier. So good hunters, that's physiological. OK, so that's how it evolves. Now I want to talk about a particular part just for a few minutes. It's pretty obvious, at least it's, it's pretty immediate. And that's language. Language is culture. But the physiology of communication is biology, right? We have a larynx, we have a tongue, and we have an oral cavity, and all sorts of other neat stuff around there that allow us to communicate verbally. We can talk to each other. How did this happen? Well, if you think about it, you might think that it's the same as in any other ape, any other primate, but it isn't. There's several really important parts. Um, and by the way, I should mention, I'm also going to talk not only about verbal communication, but facial communication. Facial communication is extremely important in humans. In fact, it's a, that's why you're here, instead of, you know, just looking at the v a video of this. Because I can express things with myself verbally and, and using my face that uh, humans like. Humans like face-to-face -face interaction. They do really well with them. OK, here's the point. We have a larynx that's low in the throat. That's what allows us to re make resonant sounds. Not just because I'm a male. Females, too. If you've ever listened to an opera singer, you know they can make resonant sounds. They'll break your eyeglasses. But chimpanzees and other apes can't do that because <clears throat> their larynx is way high up in the throat so that um, <clears throat> their lungs are disconnected from the esophagus. And that means that they can breathe and eat at the same time, and they can never choke on their food. Right? Just like an infant. If you, have, if you have a baby, you'll realize that that baby can, can um, nurse at the breast for, out, for an hour without, without taking a break, because they, they breathe while they're eating. But at the age of one and a half, the larynx has descended. The esophagus and the uh, bronchial tubes have merged up here. And until then, a baby can't talk. They can't talk because they don't have the nerves connections, and they don't have the, uh, the cavity, the oral cavity, to talk. So they can't talk. But and think about it, if you think about an ape, apes have, can only make three basic sounds, and they vary them in several ways. They can go, hee <laughs> And they go, <laughs> and they go, <laughs> and then they can add them up. You, know, you get a long sentence. He, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the, this is the, what did I, what did I say? The um, past, future subjunctive of uh, with the adverbial <laughs> subclause. You know. So they only make twelve sounds, and it's not because they're stupid, because they can communicate with humans with cards. And they can learn, some apes have learned hundreds of words. And they can communicate. They don't form real sentences, although some people say they do form real sentences. They just don't have the, the apparatus, the physiological apparatus for, for talking. So then the question is, why do we have this apparatus? Well, the most plausible answer is, we evolved this apparatus because we had complex communication. That's culture. And then an individual who can talk who, who can 
who is more verbally um, adept uh, will reproduce more because they're more highly valued in society. So all of a sudden you have a woman who can not only go hee hee, ha ha, oh, but they can go hoo. That's a fourth sound, you know. You can, you can double your output. <laughs> huh? But you can't do that unless you're, you know, you have a slightly lower larynx. So over a period of hundreds of thousands of years, culture makes language more important for communication purposes and then people evolve the physiological apparatus that would be useless if it were not for the culture. And they evolve it because people who can talk better have more babies. Why? Because they can communicate better. Think in a hunter-gatherer society. How do you get anybody to do what you want them to do? The answer is you have to persuade them because there are no big men. There's no, like in, in at chimpanzees, there's a, the, the alpha male runs everything. And if you don't like it, then fight him. Maybe you'll either lose or, you, or you'll become the alpha male. And the alpha male tells everybody what to do. But in human societies, there have, there have not been alpha males. Human societies, hunter-gatherers, are very egalitarian, mostly because, and by, you can read about this, and I'll give you some references if you want, but I think Chris Bohm's uh, hierarchy in the jungle is the best. The, m the most important reason why is before you have private property, someone who tries to force people to do things, problem is when he goes to sleep, someone hits him on the head with a rock. Okay? Now, if you, hit a, if you hit, a, hit a chimp on the head with a rock, well, he wakes up and you fight. But a human, you hit him on the head with a rock, you kill him. Not m to mention a, you know, a, a spear. So no one could convince anyone to do anything coercively in a hunter-gatherer society. The only way you could convince people to do things is if you could persuade them that it was the right thing to do. And if you go to hunter-gatherer societies today, at least I only know by my, f my friends who are anthropologists, the, the people who are most revered are very wise, and they really know how to handle you know, uh, social relations among people. And if they believe you should do something, first thing, they talk individually with a whole bunch of different people and give them the idea, and then claim it's their idea, not my idea. You know, all the things you do in an organization where you have no power. And a lot of that depends on communicate, ab ability to communicate. So what I'm saying is I wanted to give you a really dramatic example of, co of, of gene culture coevolution. Right? The culture gives us a payoff to communication. And then over hundreds of thousands of years, that gives us a vocal apparatus that allows us to uh, collect those payoffs. Now, that's pretty easy. But what I want to say is that's also true with emotions. See, that's a little more, it's not quite as physical. But we also have emotions like shame. These are called secondary emotions. The primary emotions are things we share with all animals. And actually, um, Darwin wrote a book about it called The Expression of Emotion in Animals and Humans or something like that. I forget the name of the book. But he makes it quite clear that we share all these primary emotions. And on the cover of my copy, it has one picture of a man going like this. Ah. And then right by it has another picture of a wolf going. Ah. So you immediately see that these are the same things going on. The baring of the teeth, the pulling back, the muscles here, the frowning, the putting forward of the head and back of the body, the crouching, the keeping your arms at the side in a certain way. All of these things we share with many animals, you know, who have big teeth. In fact, a lot bigger teeth than us. <laughs> 